Welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, August 14th. Looking at the South Pacific Ocean significant wave height chart, we see an area of small seas, remnant energy from a gale that was in that uh, vicinity, moving out of the California swell window. We also see another area of about 36, 37 foot seas uh, south of the Tasman Sea, not in the California swell window yet, needs to be a little bit further south, and it is expected to dissipate before it moves cleanly into the swell window. So in short, a pretty calm pattern at the moment. Let's take a look at what is to come. But before we do that, let's take a quick review of what happened the past week. Starting on Tuesday, that's Tuesday, August 9th, a small fetch started developing here in the central South Pacific, aimed pretty well to the northeast. It progressed into Wednesday, and here you see just a tiny area of 20 foot sea, 28 foot seas, mainly in the 27 foot range, but aimed pretty well to the northeast. The cutoff relative to California is right over here, so aimed pretty well at California, certainly at Central America and down into Peru and uh, Chile. That continued into through Wednesday, then a second pulse developed on Thursday, a tiny area of 30, uh, what was that, 36 foot seas. Now this pulse was aimed a little bit more to the east, not so well at California, but certainly at Chile and Peru. And then yet a third pulse developed right here on a Saturday, 28 foot seas. The thing about this one is, watch this, it pushed straight to the north, not for very long, what's that, for maybe you know, 12 hours or so, 18 hours, with 28 foot seas. So again, and, and again, all these had a tiny little fetch area except for the first pulse, but certainly a, a uh, steady dribble of rideable swell from a rather southerly direction is expected for California starting in the latter part of next week, continuing through the weekend and may and in uh, maybe into the early part of the following week, but nothing particularly uh, noteworthy. So now let's take a look at the future. We're going to start with jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales when those gales do form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, that is a push in the jet to the north, sort of forming a hook here that would help create a clockwise circulation. And in the southern hemisphere, that is synonymous with low pressure, both aloft and at the surface. That, of course, would create some wind. Wind creates seas. Seas, when it radiates away from the fetch area, creates swell. And swell, of course, when it hits your beach, creates surf. So as of right now, we don't see a whole lot going on. The main jet stream track, the northern branch here, is up about 25 north or um, 25 south, and the southern branch is all but gone other than this little sort of a uh, ridge that's developing, the exact opposite of what you'd want to see. There's a little bit of a trough right here, but we're not talking much. Now I roll this out. This ridge really pretty much continues into Monday and Tuesday. This pretty much just suppresses swell development or gale development in this whole region right here. Split jet stream between these two here, you get high pressure. That doesn't do anything. A little bit of a trough here on Wednesday trying to develop, but the ice line is right somewhere around 62 or so south. So whatever fetch were to develop, it would do nothing but blow penguins and make them cold. Doesn't do a whole lot for us. But then we get into Thursday or so and the trough tries to get a little one, a little bit more wind energy in it, hundred and what is that, forty knot winds trying to move a little bit north of the 60 degree line. So we'll just sort of see what happens now. See, it pushes into Antarctica. A little bit of a trough here still on Friday, but not a whole lot. Maybe there's some hope right in here on Saturday. And then we go on into Sunday. Then what also happens here? Oops, that's, uh, yeah, no, here we go. Right there, we see another trough starting to develop, but just barely clear, if at all, of the ice line down here. So two little areas to watch at, look at. Let's go take a look at the surface charts, see what happens there. So here we go, surface level pressure, surface level winds, weak low pressure, remnant low pressure from a system that created seas and those three pulses of swell that we talked about earlier, but that's gonna dissipate. High pressure between the two splits in the jet, Low pressure south of the Tasman Sea, 45 knot winds generating seas as we saw in the 30 plus foot range. But let's put this into motion. As you can see, whatever fetch is here dies out quickly. This fetch here 
And this is by Sunday Night Even Dies Out. Not a whole lot going on. We're looking for 35 knot or greater winds. So that'd be, you know, this sort of uh, orangish color here. And preferably 40 to 45 knot winds. And there's just nothing going on. And that's as expected based on the surface level charts. A little bit of fetch here, mid-level low. Typically, these are overstated by the models. Um, this is a, a cutoff low. Uh, not really associated with the main jet stream flow at all. We do, and falling south, so we don't expect a whole lot from that. So now we're into Friday. Remember in the jet we saw a little something going on right in this area. And sure enough, low pressure tries to organize. Here's a little tiny patch of 45 knot winds. 35 knot winds pushing north into Saturday. And then here comes the other fetch under New Zealand on Sunday almost. Trying to organize... And there's 45 knot winds. That's actually something to almost get interested in. Pretty broad area, but it's 180 hours out. The models just do a horrible job of, of really uh, knowing what's going on more in about four or five days out. So not believable at the moment, but something to look at. Let's go take a look at the significant wave height charts, see what effect these winds are to have on the ocean surface. So here we go. Current chart. Seas. Pretty small. Barely in the California swell window, fading from that system that is supposed that has produced three pulses of swell. The system under the Tasman Sea, what is that? Thirty uh, six foot seas. And we'll just put this into motion, and you see it just all but fades out here. Nothing going on. So pretty much a calm ocean state. You really need at least thirty foot seas to get a decent swell pushing up towards California, because it's a five five to six thousand nautical. About 5,000 nautical miles from here, 6,000 nautical miles from over here, or more. So uh, swell decay normally takes its toll on any of these swells unless they have pretty decent size associated with them. Here's the, the ice line, right at about 62, eh, maybe down to 64 or so there, and up to almost 60 south right there. So a lot of ice in the southern hemi this time of year, and that, that is normal and to be expected. So now we're into 174 hours out, really nothing going on until you get to the 180-hour run, and then we see 34-foot seas here. Not believable just barely off the ice line, not aimed particularly well to the north, more to the east. Um, at this point in time, we almost start taking more interest in the northern hemi than the southern hemi, but still, southern hemi is dominant at this time, um, but not a whole lot expected for the next week. So we're taking a look at the northern hemisphere. This is a week back, Sunday, August 7th. This was tropical storm. Might have been Typhoon Omeus. Um, actually, at this point, you see most of the fetch was aimed at Japan when it was even further south. It had some fetch aimed north, which was somewhat up the Great Circle Pass in northern California. Swell from that system is already hitting exposed breaks at a whopping foot and a half at 15 seconds yesterday and I think it's down to 14 seconds today so not a whole lot now Omeas we're watching that and then on Tuesday or Wednesday of last week it had 27 foot seas and started turning to the northeast again another little pulse of swell is expected from about 306 308 degrees yeah, two feet at 15 seconds or so now watch Omeas it went up into the Bering Sea on Friday Saturday and then fell just barely out and that was Saturday night it made what maybe 18 foot seas in the Gulf of Alaska and that was it and nothing more maybe some wind swell from that the uh, California pressure gradient is supposed to fire up to create local wind swell so maybe on Wednesday there'll be something to ride and and whoops and that was that and now we look at the current chart going into the future forecast. Of course, the remnants of Omeas just dissipate. Other tropical systems in the far in the far west Pacific, but all of them are expected to be tracking to the northwest. No real fetch aimed up. A little tiny, what's that, 20, 26 foot seas probably, but probably nothing of interest to come from that. Too little, too far away. And then we just keep watching. Here's the California pressure gradient. Actually, let's roll that back. You can see a pretty good area of, oh, what is that, 15-foot uh, seas or so. And so that's good for local wind cell for central California for uh, the latter part of the week. And then that starts fading out by Friday. 
and then things get kind of quiet. But about that time, that's when the southern hemiswell is supposed to be working its way, the three pulses of southern hemiswell working its way into California. So that's probably a bit of a good thing. And then, so we're just, we're waiting basically for the North Pacific to come online. It's not there yet. We've been looking at the jet stream charts. It's trying a little bit, but uh, there, there's not a whole lot of fuel to get it going. El Nino has pretty much disappeared. There's lingering bits of energy up in the upper levels of the jet stream. But the good news is La Nina hasn't really taken over either. So it's just kind of a neutral position at the moment, but we'll get into that in just a second. So we talked a little bit about the uh, California pressure gradient. You can see it here, high pressure off the coast gets abutted up against Northern California here. The desert, high desert here, creates a lot of uplift, heat, creating low pressure. The difference between low pressure and high pressure here creates a tightening of the space of the isobars which results in wind, in this case, north wind. And the standard deal in California in the summer is there's a lot of this wind right up here off North California that creates wind and local wind swell. So as you can see, as we get into Monday, 30 knot north winds start developing into Northern California. Nothing super significant, continuing mainly 25 to 30 knots into Tuesday. And then it really blooms on Wednesday, 35 knot winds. Now, the other part about this is you have the north winds here, but it's sort of like a low pressure. You end up with south winds here when the gradient gets defined enough along the immediate California coast, which is pretty kind of a good thing. It sort of uh, helps clean up the wind swell a little bit. So decent wind swell expected Wednesday. Then Thursday, the gradient still 25 north winds, not north winds. The uh, south flow, eddy flow continues along the coast. And then the gradient starts fading out Friday. And then as you get into the weekend, things just slowly start calming down completely. And this is kind of typical of late August. You're on the verge of um, um, waiting for the winter pattern to come online, and it hasn't. The southern hemis dying, and so, and even wind swell starts fading. You just end up with kind of a calm pattern, not a whole lot going on, waiting for the seasons to kick the balance over from the southern hemi to the northern hemi, and so that's about where we are. Let's take a look long term now. Madden-Julian oscillation, again, oscillation that runs about four to six weeks on and off that can help support storm formation or suppress it. The longer oscillation, El Nino, La Nina, let's call it five to seven year oscillation, doing the same sort of thing. And then, of course, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which runs anywhere from 15 to 25 years. And, you know, the positive phase, the PDO, supports the formation of El Nino and storms. And the downside of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation sort of suppresses it. Not as strict as one might, you know, as, as we're sort of representing it here. But the trend and the tendency is in those directions. And so, first off, let's talk about the Madden-Julian Oscillation. And what we're looking for is, we call it the Kelvin Wave Generation Area. You could call it the MJO Area, too. The main area that we're interested in is from about 170 west, right on the equator, 5 degrees north or south, so here's the date line. And then going almost, that's New Guinea there, almost to uh, the, as far in the west Pacific as you can get. What we're looking for is west winds here. We certainly don't see that. We see east winds over the entirety of the equatorial Pacific right now. But when you get west winds here, or at least calm winds, that tends to help feed the jet stream, both in the north and southern hemi, more so in the winter in the north Pacific than in the summer in the south Pacific, but just the same. So we're looking for differences in normal. This is what the winds are doing. But for this time of year, winds are pretty much neutral in the east Pacific. And notice this just slight little bit. We see some west winds there, a little bit of a westerly anomaly here. This would suggest that the active phase of the MJO, the one that tends to support storm production, both in the north and the southern hemisphere, is trying to make a move, or at least one would assume that from this chart. This is actual buoys on the ocean surface measuring the data. Can't argue with it. It's not a model. Next, we take a look at the GFS models, 850 millibar wind anomalies. This is up about 4,500 feet in the air, but a good proxy for what's going on down the surface. Kelvin wave generation area runs pretty, so this is the whole world, wrap it all around. But the area we're interested in, Kelvin wave generation area, is pretty much between these two tick marks right here. You can see as of right now, 
Um, here's the whole chart. You can see Dateline, so roughly there to roughly about there. You can see inactive phase of the MJO. The blues are east anomalies have been in control for pretty much the whole month of July. No wonder there hadn't been a whole lot of surf. Pretty much it, that's what you'd expect. The good news is come as we get into August here, that pattern appears to be dying out. It's moving. If you can, you can actually draw a line through this and see it's slowly moving off to the east. And this oscillation is, again, four to six weeks. So that's about on schedule. We see little bits of westerly anomalies trying to start building in over the next week. Nothing super solid. Most of the anomalies here are in the Indian Ocean. That would be expected with uh, La Nina in play. If it was El Nino, these anomalies would be over in here like they were last year. And that's what helps support storm formation. So we're sort of ha even you know, when the active phase is doing its thing, it's still more concentrated in the Indian Ocean than the West Pacific, and that's going to be the theme for this winter. Another way to look for the active or inactive phase of the MJO is by outgoing long wave radiation. That is how much cloud cover there is over various parts of the ocean. Uh, negative anomalies, the blues, suggest the active phase of the MJO. That means more cloud cover, less sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface, and therefore meaning the active phase of the MJO. Inactive phase in the Indian Ocean here. Two weeks out here per the statistical model suggests the active phase of the MJO is to dissipate and the inactive phase ease west. Well, while the GEFS model, dynamic model, suggests if anything, the active phase is not only supposed to hold but build, this is the preferred outcome. Let's see what some of the other models say. Here's yet another way to look for the presence of the active phase of the MJO. Assume this circle here is the north pole of our planet looking down, and the active phase is where the big dot is, so it's in the West Pacific. That's good news. That's consistent with what the other models said. Now, the active phase runs counterclockwise around this chart, typically from the West Pacific over the U.S. into the Atlantic, back over Africa. This is on the equator only into the Indian Ocean, then back over the maritime continent, over the dateline, etc. So right now, active phase is, oh, and if you're in this circle, it's very weak. So we're modest strength in the West Pacific, a little bit east of the dateline. The GEFS model says just basically the same thing. Now, the interesting part is both these models suggest the active phase is basically supposed to hold at this general strength, if anything, retrograde a little bit towards the dateline over the next two weeks through August 28th. So that would not be bad. That would help support storm formation in the southern hemisphere and maybe a little bit in the northern hemisphere as well, or at least help fuel tropical activity in the northern hemi in the West Pacific. And with a bit of luck, some of that tropical activity might recurve rather than moving into Asia and uh, Kamchatka, might recurve, make it over the dateline and push into the Gulf of Alaska. But that is probably an opt optimistic assumption. Here's yet another way to look at this. Again, 850 millibar winds per the CFS model. Um, again, up about 4,500 feet. Here's current time. Here's past history down here. Yellows are westerly anomalies. And you can kind of see it right here. Oh, and the main area we're interested in is pretty much right down in the middle of the picture. That's the Kelvin wave generation area. You see westerly anomalies here right in this area as of August 14th and expected to continue in pockets till you know, almost mid-September. Watch this. We'll do this. And there you can see that's associated. This dark contour is the active phase of the MJO moving east over time. Okay, little bits of easterly anomalies here, but still a little bit of support. This is generally a very weak MJO signal. You look further out into September, inactive phase of the MJO is forecast. Easterly anomalies uh, forecast to build a little, but nothing exceptional. And then you get into the October time frame, the active phase reemerges stronger at least per this model, but typically what happens, the closer we get, the weaker it gets. And so the general trend has been since you can look here. This was the last, even in June, there was actually a pretty good pulse of westerly anomalies, but the trend has been for just a very weak wind pattern, neither strong, uh, suggestive of the inactive or the active phase, the MJO. And that's not unusual given the demise of El Nino and trending towards some flavor of La Nina. 
So the MJO, kind of weak, forecast to try to make a bit of a push here in the next week or two, but nothing super impressive. Let's take a look, subsurface temperature dynamics, West Pacific here, East Pacific, we're looking down into the ocean. These are actual hard sensors here, helping to tell us what subsurface uh, temperatures are doing. Warm water piled up in the West Pacific, cooler water in the East Pacific. This is suggestive of, the, of uh, La Nina. Uh, when El Nino was in play, all the warm water was over here. It's sloshing back to the West Pacific. Pretty typical. Driven by uh, normal trades, at least, if not stronger than normal trades. It just basically pushes it all here, and you get a big old bubble of it. Uh, differences in normal for this time of year, and what you see is, yeah, a little bit of warm water here, one degree above normal, but nothing particularly, you know, eye-catching. The Kelvin wave path typically is you get westerly anomalies here. That pushes this warm water to depth here, and then it starts working its way to the east, and that helps set up El Nino. We have none of that right now. If anything, it's a cool, a cool water pipeline. But you know what? It's looking a lot weaker than it was a month ago, two months ago, four months ago. This is kind of, if this is La Nina, it's very weak. It's almost normal temperatures here in the East Pacific. We've got this pool that's developing here, basically the all the warm water or the cool water is venting to the surface out here westward displaced not along ecuador that's a good thing that suggests there's not a lot of energy behind uh la nina at the moment and a little bit higher resolution view of that same picture suggests actually there's more cool water making it to the east than the previous picture suggests but there's some sort of a barrier here and we've seen this consistently yeah this model's uh, this is a model view of what's going on suggests there's cool water here but what we're seeing is the main migration path is this way and then up to the surface here at about 140 west, so just a little bit east of Hawaii. And this is where the main eruption bubble is of the cooler water, warm water, all off to the west. Not so much going on here off to the east. Upper ocean heat anomalies. This is actual uh, amount of heat energy in the ocean. Assume, uh, and assume, uh, let's see, the Kelvin wave generation area, and uh, this is just Pacific, so this is the whole Pacific Ocean here. You can see Kelvin waves during El Nino. First, uh, this is like Kelvin wave number four, Kelvin wave number five, Kelvin wave number six in February of 2016. Then you see the onset, all the cool water that was over here in the West Pacific rushing to the east. This is the onset of La Nina. You see there's a big cool pool here. And then it kind of faded. It's trying to pulse again right now. But the question is, how strong will it get? Will it get like this? And current thinking is right now, probably not. There's just There doesn't seem to be a lot of energy or, or, or uh, momentum associated with this La Nina. And that's a good thing for us. So here we go, sea surface temperatures and anomalies. Just looking at the ocean's temperature differences in normal. If La Nina was strong, you'd expect to see a whole bunch of blues here off of Peru. What you get is high pressure down here just going to town. It creates an upwelling pattern here along the coast of Peru. Cold water basically starts advecting to the surface uh, or migrating up to the surface and then tracking here along the Galapagos and out this way. Now you can see definitely that cool, the cool pool here along the Galapagos and out south of Hawaii. There's Hawaii and running almost 10 degrees north and south of the equator. We'll give it eight degrees and a couple lingering last little pockets here of La, uh, of El Nino warm water. The Nino 3.4 region is from 120 west from 5 north to 5 south and right along here that's the area that NOAA uses to measure um, either the the output of El Nino or La Nina and one could look at this and say the balance of the temperatures are on the colder side at least neutral and there's more on its way this actually kind of sh this area shut down a week or two ago but it's starting to come back online and push more cold water out this way a lot of this water is coming from depth you saw the cool water at depth down 100 meters and that's what's happening it's gurgling to the surface getting pulled by the trades and pushed off to the west. The temperature trend for the past seven days, and we're really looking along here, this was much cooler about three days ago that there was stronger cooling going on. It's still happening, but weaker, and there's little pockets of warming too. But oh, it, by and large, the cooling trend is taking priority or has more velocity or strength than, than the warming. Uh, we also look over here 
off of Africa to get a sense of maybe what's to come. And there's been a slight warming pattern here, and this has been going on for about a week now. So we're thinking that maybe whatever the cool pulse was that's occurring right now might start losing its energy shortly. And finally, the big view, you can see La Nina, cooler than normal water, right here on the equator. Cal uh, the Nino 3.4 region draw box right here, and plenty of blue, cooler, not super cold, a degree or so in spots and less. Um, not so much along here, which is kind of interesting. This is sort of like last year's El Nino was westward displaced. This La Nina seems westward displaced as well, suggesting. And when you get that westward displacement, you know, uh, you, you, I'm not going to call it a, a Midoki uh, La Nina, which was where all the warming or cooling is out this way. But it's sort of looking like that way. It just it generally means it doesn't have a lot of energy associated with it. And that's a good thing for us. We don't want some raging La Nina because that would just kill the winter surf season for sure in the North Pacific. But it's almost just, well, we'll look at some numbers here, but not looking very impressive. So here's sea surface temperatures in the Nino 1.2 region. This is the area right there along Peru and Ecuador out to the Galapagos. And here's neutral right now. And basically, it's suggesting we're normal. It's actually been warmer here in June, uh, July and June. It really hasn't even gone that negative. So there was some major uh, La Nina going on. You'd expect to see these temps down around in here, and they're not there at all. That's good. But the region that really matters is the Nino 3.4 area from 120 west out to 170 west. And you can see it's, if you can draw a line through this, it, the trend is steadily downward. But as of right now, it seems to have evened off. Current data says 0.5. Yeah, that's about right. Okay, the scale change here. That is 0.5, and that's minus 1 degree. So 0.5, half a degree, that's the threshold for La Nina. If you're one degree, uh, one half of a degree below normal or more, you're at La Nina. So we've been, well, we were in that range for a little bit of July, then we were out of it, but we're hovering right around half a degree. Now, this is the interesting thing. Here was our El Nino. This is sea surface temperatures, Nino 3.4 region, same area we're just looking at. Here's what was happening back in October, the peak of, uh, of um, El Nino back in the November-ish time frame, almost three degrees above normal. Then we've gone through the transition towards La Nina. We've about bottomed out, according to this model here, in, uh, in August, and now it says temperatures are actually supposed to rise to only about minus two and a half, minus 0.25 degrees. Kind of hard to believe. Earlier, the, mo the models have been steadily hovering at about minus half a degree or 0.6. Either way, though, come January, temperatures are supposed to return to normal by the April time frame and maybe even above normal. Uh, that maybe is just a peak. The expectation it it hover if this La Nina is as weak as it's looking to be, it's barely La Nina. Again, has to be at a minus half degree and hold for three months. We'll probably get there. I don't know about this spike here. But um interesting. We're not going to move towards El Nino, but we'll move probably towards just a neutral state. And this means we might get off easy. Don't want to say that too loud too early yet, but if this is all the La Nina we get, that's a good thing. But what that also suggests is that maybe the PDO has changed. We are moving into a 15 plus year cycle more favorable towards La Nina than that. I mean, towards El Nino, that would suggest that La Nina would be weak and probably won't manifest itself very strongly. So what impact has this cooler water in the Nino 3.4 region had on the atmosphere? Well, when we were in El Nino back January 2014, you can see the pulses of the MJO here. The downward pulses are the active phase, the MJO. The upward pulses are the inactive phase. Here's our El Nino, all downward phase, peaking out somewhere January, February this year. Then we got to about April, uh, April May, and you can see big, big inactive phase. And the Southern Oscillation Index, that, that's what we're looking at here, 30-day running average difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, and Tahiti, is positive, but very weakly so, not suggestive of a strong La Nina. That's good. That means the atmosphere really isn't feeling the effects, at least right now, 
of that cool water on the equator in the Nino 3.4 region, and that gives us some hope for the coming winter, not only from a surf perspective, but also maybe per, from a precipitation and snow perspective for the California Sierra Nevada range. And the ESPI index, very similar to the Southern Oscillation Index, but it's looking for actual precipitation in the area north of Darwin, Australia, just like uh, um, the Southern Oscillation Index, and then north of Tahiti, a little bit more uh, broader areas here rather than points. Negative value, that's the current value, minus 1.56, suggestive of La Nina, and drier than normal conditions here, and wetter than normal conditions here, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Definitely indicative of La Nina, but not super strong. When we were in El Nino, it was like 2.6 or something like that towards the peak, positive 2.6. So we're, we're not as far down yet as we were during El Nino. So the short of it, at this point in time, small southern hemi swell working its way towards the California coast, but too far displaced over in the East Pacific to have any effect on Hawaii, but some swell on the way, something rideable. Wind swell also for Northern California uh, midweek or so and, and working its way almost to the weekend. Longer term, active phase of the MJO looks like it's probably going to uh, work its way and hold around for two to three weeks. Uh, may be helping to fuel some sort of gale development. There is something projected southeast of New Zealand a week out, but that's too too uh, far out to be believable. Um, but the hope would be if it hangs around long enough, maybe we'll get some uh, tropical activity recurving and moving towards the Gulf of Alaska. But again, that's a bit of a reach. Beyond that, MJO is supposed to turn inactive, but weekly so. And almost like the MJO has no effect, even longer term than that. We're looking at the uh, uh, La Nina in play. Not super strong, but it's definitely there. Its effect on the atmosphere, kind of negligible at the moment. Uh, that will probably amplify a little bit as we get into the fall, but the model suggests nothing too dras drastic, maybe just a bare minimal La Nina. And then beyond that, PDO, we're thinking it's moving towards the active phase. We won't know till probably next summer, another year out or so. But if La Nina is muted this winter, that would sure be a strong indicator. And as soon as we get all you know the numbers updated, and we do this every every couple of weeks, uh, the PDO index updates only once a month. But right now, definitely, uh, it's moving back towards neutral. It was very, very strongly favored and influenced by El Nino. But if we get into this La Nina and it just stays neutral, that, that's a good sign for us. So that's it for this week. We'll do it again next week. Same time, same channel. See you then.